Thank you, Mr. President, for those kind words of introduction. Dean Marcus, members of the faculty, Board of Governors, alumni, parents, family, and friends, and to the class of 2016, I'm honored and delighted to be with you on this very important occasion. To each and every one of you receiving a diploma today, congratulations. This is your day. Enjoy it. Take a long, deep breath and take it all in. For tomorrow, you must be prepared to roll up your sleeves because this world, this little piece of real estate, is waiting for talent men and women like you to lead it to a better place. Now, I didn't grow up in a big city like this beautiful city. I didn't grow up in a big city like Los Angeles or San Francisco. I didn't grow up in a big city like Washington, D.C., or New York, or Atlanta. I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, how many of you graduate remember when you were four? What happened to the rest of us? My father had saved $300, and a man sold him 110 acres of land. My family is still on this land today. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I know here at Port Iran, you're very smart. You're gifted. But you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> I know you're gifted when it comes to research and studying the great issues of our time. But you don't know anything about raising chickens. I know some of you probably like to eat chicken. But on that farm, it was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chickens. When the setting hen was set, I had to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you smart, gifted graduates are not saying, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more fresh eggs. Do you follow me? You don't follow me. It's OK. So when these little chicks were hatched, I would fool these setting hen. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen, or put them in a box with a lantern, raise them on their own, get some more fresh eggs, and mark them with a pencil, and place them under the setting hen. I kept on cheating on, the, on these setting hens and fooling these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher from the Sizzle Roebuck store. Now, most of you are just too young. You don't even know anything about the Sizzle Roebuck catalog. Maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents, maybe some of your teachers, maybe not. Well, the Sizzle Roebuck catalog is a very big book. It's a heavy book, thick book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I just kept on wishing. But when I was about nine or 10 years old, I wanted to be a minister. So with the help of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. My brothers and sisters and cousins were lying on the outside of the chicken yard, but around the chicken yard. 
And I will start speaking or preaching. And when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produced eggs. Well, that's enough of that. Growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, about 45 miles from Tuskegee, when we visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white women. They go downtown on a Saturday afternoon to the theater. All of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony. All of the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I kept saying to my mother, to my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? Why this? Why that? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But the action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way. I got in the way. I got in trouble, what I call good trouble. As you leave this great institution, what he ran, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, to help redeem not just the soul of America, but the soul of our little planet. You have an obligation. You have a mission, a mandate to save our little planet for generation yet unborn and leave it a little cleaner, a little greener, and a little more peaceful. So, as the dean said, be bold, be brave, be courageous, just go for it. And in doing so, be happy, enjoy yourself, and never ever give up, never ever give in. Be optimistic. Don't get lost in a sea of despair. Keep the faith. And never, never, ever become bitter. Never, ever hate, for hate is too heavy a burden to bear. When we were planning the march on Washington in 1963, when I was 23 years old, and I spoke number six. Dr. King spoke number 10 of the 10 speakers. Out of the 10 people that spoke that day, I'm the only one still around. And after the march was all over, President Kennedy invited us down to the White House, to the Oval Office. He stood in the door and greeted each one of us. And he kept saying, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, you did a good job and you had a dream. When historians pick up their pen and write about this period, they should be able to say to each one of you that you did a good job and you dream to make our country, to make our world, and our planet a better place. So just get out there and push and keep pushing and you will have the victory not just for yourselves, but for humanity. I want to tell you, if someone had told me when I was preaching to those chickens, on occasion I tried to baptize some of them, and it just didn't work, <laughs> that one day I would be standing here as a member of the House of Representatives, that I've had an opportunity to meet with every president since President Kennedy, to travel to South Africa and meet Nelson Mandela, 
to host him in Washington, to travel to Rome and meet the Pope. When the Pope came and spoke to a joint session of the Congress, he said to each and all of us that we all are immigrants. We all come from some other place. So as we live during this period in our history, in this country, but around the world, as the late A. Philip Randolph, the Dean of Black Leadership during the 60s said over and over again, maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. We must look out for each other and care for each other. So it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we're straight or gay. We are one people, we are one family, we are one house. We all live in the same house, the world house. And when we see people putting people down because of their race, their color, their faith, or because who they love, you have a moral obligation to speak up to speak out and get in the way. When we see violence in our midst, similar to the violence that happened a week ago in Orlando, you have to do something. You have to assess something. You have to be prepared to condemn it. Maybe with your research, your studies, you can find a way to try to get humankind to be a little more human. What's wrong with saying to someone, I love you? In the Congress, I said to many of my colleagues and friends, I said, how are you doing today, brother? How are you feeling today, sister? There's a member, I call his first name, it's Paul. And I said to him, and I see him each day, hello, Brother Paul. And he said to me, hello, Brother John. It's another member, first name is Louise. We came to Congress together to say, hello, Sister Louise, how you doing? She said, how you doing, Brother John? Just love everybody. Love is a better way. Never ever get so mighty, so powerful, so smart that you will forget to love. Love your friends, your family. Love your associates and help create what Dr. King called the beloved community of the beloved wall. We can do it. We must do it. I wish you well. I'm going to tell a little story, and I will be finished. Today is your day. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery on that farm, I had an aunt by the name of Seneva. And my aunt Seneva lived in a shotgun house. Now here in Santa Monica, here in this beautiful state, here, you don't know what I'm talking about. You've never seen a shotgun house. What is that? Well, my aunt Seneva lived in a shotgun house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn. Had a simple plain dirt yard. And sometime at night, you can look up through the holes in the ceiling, the holes in the tin roof, and count the stars. When it rain, should we get a pail, a bucket, a tub, and catch the rainwater? From time to time, she would walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and tie these branches together 
and make a broom, and she called that broom the brush broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard very clean, especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted the dirt yard to look very good during the weekend. For you, very young and smart and talented graduates, well, you don't know what a shotgun house is. In a nonviolent sense, old house, one way in, where you can bounce a basketball through the front door and it will go straight out the back door. But one Saturday afternoon, my Aunt Seneva saw us all playing in her front yard. And an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing. The thunder started rolling. The lightning started flashing. And the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. She called us all in and told us to hold hands. The wind continued to blow. The thunder continued to roll. The lightning continued to flash. And the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. My aunt Sineva thought the old house was going to blow away. She became terrified. She started crying. She thought the house would blow away. So she got all of us to hold hands. When one corner of this little house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that side. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. I said to you, the wind may blow, the thunder may roll, and the lightning may flash, and the rain may beat down on our old house. But you have an obligation. You have a mission. You have a mandate to stay with the house and hold on to your principles. Hold on to your beliefs. Hold it the house of what he ran. Call it the house of California. Call it the house of New York or Georgia. Call it the American house. Call it the world house. We all live in the same house. Let's stay together. And never give up. Never give in. Keep the faith and walk with the spirit of this institution. And you'll be all right. Thank you very much.